Astro Bestie, and welcome to another episode of ASMR in the Best Possible Timeline. Today's episode is going to be our second book review, and the books that I have for this episode are my favorite books on the subject of love, romance, dating, except, of course, I already mentioned in the very first episode um, about books, my favorite books. The Art of Loving is like the penultimate, it's the best book on the subject of love and dating. But aside from The Art of Loving, which is the best book ever, these three books uh, I give often as gifts and I, I feel like the insight in them is really invaluable. One honorable mention is a book called The Science of Trust. It's my favorite book by the author John Gottman. Um, I think The Seven Principles of a successful marriage is his most common book, but the science of trust I love. I didn't include it because it's like this thick and it gets it's pretty dense and like scientific. So it's not for everybody. Um, but John Gottman is amazing. Uh, his work is phenomenal. He's like the relationship expert. Supposedly you can sit down with a couple and within like 15 minutes and 90% accuracy be like, mm. I give them two years, or I give them six months, or eleven years, and they like break up exactly when he says they're going to. So his whole thing is about responsiveness, which is very in line with uh, Eric Fromm's thing of um, acting with active care and concern. So those are all very in alignment. Those books are amazing. Um, they're honestly better than any of these books, but one I already talked about, and one. It's kind of thick, um, but they're really, really good. There's in there's an article that summarizes a lot of what I love about John Gottman, and I'll link it in the description box below, where he talks about the masters of love. Basically, the take home is respond to the needs of your partner, and so he talks about um, he makes these like fake situations. This will be like a bed and breakfast. And a couple will go there, and for a while they'll be weird, acting weird, because everything is videotaped. But after a while, they're like, slip into their old patterns, right? And so the example that he gives is, um, a woman is reading, and her husband loves birds. That's his thing, he's a bird watcher. And he's like, oh my god, there, look at this bird, honey. It's a rare, stellar blue jay. I don't know if that's a bird, I just made that up. So at this point, she can put the book down and walk over to him and be like, oh my god. And that is active, constructive. That's the best thing you can do for your relationship. Or she can be like, fuck you and your bird. And that is active, destructive. That's not good. But actually, the worst one is passive, destructive. If she just ignores him and is like, that's the worst thing you can do for a relationship. It's one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse that Gottman talks about. Um, and then there's passive, constructive, so she can be like, that's great, but not really like active in her constructive. So there's only one right way to respond. And if you respond the right way uh, to people's bids, that's what Gottman calls them, I think 85% of the time, like, you'll be good, but you'd be surprised how many relationships people aren't doing that. Um, and then obviously if someone's like, look, I have a wound that's activated or a really big need right now, and you choose not to respond, that's super bad for your relationship. It's not really rocket science, but those are not these books. These books are easier to read, and they're really fun. Um, so we will start with the funnest one. So this book is called He's Just Not That Into You. And there's a movie supposedly about this book. The movie has like nothing to do with the book. The movie sucks. I don't know why they think they're even right. This book doesn't have a plot. It doesn't have a story. 
in the City and he was a consultant on Sex and the City so that's how they came together and the book goes back and forth between what each of them said it's like they're having a conversation for a lot of it and then they have these like little case studies um, in here and letters that people wrote to Greg uh, dear Greg you know I've been dating a guy for two years blah 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 and basically the moral of the story is like Liz and all the people writing are making excuses and Greg's like if he was that into you nothing would be able to stop him from being with you from expressing that like he would cross the desert barefoot and naked on a donkey to see you if he really was that into you like men will do everything in their power when they care enough so if you're at all confused if you're trying to figure things out like let me just tell you it's figured out he's not that into you this is big take home um yeah i had some stuff that i wanted to read uh this i don't know who wrote this it just says this on the side of the book but i was like i agree with this um he says he's just not that into you is a provocative hilarious and above all intoxicatingly liberating it deserves a place on every woman's night table it knows you're beautiful smart funny woman who deserves better the next time you feel the need to start figuring him out consider the glorious thought that maybe he's not that into you and then set yourself loose and find someone who is so that's that's very much this book um let's see the other part i wanted to share with you i thought was funny uh this i think it's a chapter or maybe it's just a it's a i don't know i haven't read this book in a long time um i just got it from the library to share with you he says you are all dating the same guy hey i know the guy you're dating yeah i do he's the guy that's so tired from work so stressed out about the project he's working on he's been through an awful breakup and it's really hitting him hard his parents divorce has scarred him and he has trust issues right now he needs to focus on his career he can't get involved with anyone until he knows what his life is about he just got a new apartment and the move is a bitch as soon as all of it comes down he'll leave his wife his girlfriend his crappy job god he's so complicated he is a man made up entirely of your excuses and the minute you stop making excuses for him he will completely disappear from your life there are men who are too busy and have gone through something so horrible that it makes it hard for them to get involved but there are so few of them that they should be considered urban legends as for already suggested a man would rather be trampled by elephants that are on fire than tell you he's not that into you it's why we've written this book we wanted to get the excuses out of the closet so to speak so they can see be seen for what they are really bad excuses so that is the first book recommendation and i can't tell you how many times i've seen a, a friend of mine go through something like this and literally like given them this book for christmas for i just gave it to someone last christmas for um for their birthday just any reason i'm like this is here you go <laughs> the answer to what ails you um if a guy wants to be with you enough, he will make it very obvious and known and do whatever it takes to be with you. And that is the lesson for me, it's just not that into you. So I love this book and um, yeah, I hope you do too. I think it's really funny, very quick read, highly recommend. Other It is called The Four 
stay into a hilarious math problem where like you have to go out with every man who has you on a date and then you have to go out with him twice and um, then you can say no to the third date. Uh, it's all about like gathering data and I think you can't be kissing more than one guy at a time um, and they all fill up this matrix. I think the matrix has four main squares and each of those squares breaks down into another four squares for a total of 16 squares. It's been years since I read this, but I think that's the way that it goes. Um, yeah, it's so funny. So this is the two date minimum flow chart. And so two date minimum flow chart. So it's like first date, you like him, uh, call from him, say yes. Second date. Him, no call from him. You call him. He says no. Stop. And uh, if you can, get a second date. If you don't like him, and there, you get a call from him, you have to say yes and go on the date. If you don't like him and he he doesn't call, then you have to call him. And if he doesn't want to, no date. But if he wants to, you have to go on a second date. Um, so she says all kinds of funny things. Like there's a, a visual for a half man. Um, so if someone fills up two of the squares on your chart, then he's a half a man. And the idea is to find someone who fills up all four, and that person is your boyfriend. Um, so that's why it's called the four man plan. You should have four guys going at all times. Okay.
the airport to pick him up, I gave myself a pep talk. You can do this. He's your father and he's reaching out. I stood at the gate as his flight arrived and passengers were filing off the plane. I realized that I didn't know what he looked like, so I tried to draw a mental picture of him. I muttered to myself under my breath while I scanned the crowd. He's much older now. His hair is probably gray. He might be hunched over. Heck, I was six inches short, shorter last time I saw him. I might be taller than him. Maybe if he's just a little old man, don't look shocked. These were the thoughts when Cupid's arrow shot straight through my heart. This gorgeous guy was getting off the plane. He had sunglasses on, indoors, a leather jacket, and a confident swagger. I completely forgot why, why I was there. Who is this hot guy? I honed in on him. My body viscerally pulled in that love at first sight. I'm not going to lose him in this crowd in a movie moment kind of way. As I got within 25 feet, I realized this guy was my father. Ew! I shuddered. Oh no. I was not okay in that moment. My conscious daddy redemption quest became a fully conscious slap in the face. I woke up to my neurosis and decided to quit my abandonment quest cold turkey. So that was a pivotal moment in her, um, yeah, development where she decides to this is cool. I'm Chinese. We're good at math. <laughs> so yeah, then she turns dating into this hilarious math problem that um, I did not ever follow to the T. I never went out with everybody who asked me. I think she wrote this before dating apps were like a thing. Um, but some of the ideas really resonated with me. And I have, um, they, they did, like, open my mind a bit, and here's one of them. It's called The Expectation List. So, she says, write a list of all your must-have and desirable qualities in a man. Don't be afraid to get a little shallow in specific examples. Handsome, successful, sexy, charming, and fixing, drives a nice car, makes a great margarita, so you write down everything you want and then at the bottom in fact if you want to pause this video right now and go do that because you'll never be able to do that again without knowing what i'm about to tell you so i'll just give you a moment do it pause and write a list of your expectations things you want in a guy and then at the end of the list she writes honest Like, intro. 
intro to psychological attachment theory, um, but it's a really helpful way to think about our patterns in relationships, and um, I, I haven't read this in a long time, but I'm pretty sure in the beginning of the book they talk about something called the strange situation test, which is where psychologists bring a caretaker, usually a mother, into a room full of toys with a small child, and the child and observe what the child does. Now, most kids go to play with the toys, um, and then the mother slips out. And when the kid realizes that the mother slips out, they'll do one of a couple things, right? They'll freak out, um, or they'll just be like, whatever, and keep playing with the toys. Now, when the mom comes back, they can do one of a couple things. They could be like, whatever, who cares? Or they can be like, oh my god, where were you? Uh, or like, oh, I'm so glad you're here. And then after they're like, oh, I'm so glad, uh, they'll either go back to playing with the toys or they'll be like on top of their mom. So according to psychologists who use this strange situation test, um, the avoidant babies are the ones who's like, I don't care that you're gone. I don't care that you came back. I keep myself safe. Who needs you? And uh, the anxious babies like freak out when their mom leaves, and then when she comes back, it's like, I love you, I hate you, how could you cold me? Um, and then the secure ones are like, Oh, I'm so glad you're here, I'm gonna go play with the toys. So, again, this is intro to attachment theory, it gets more complicated, but the book doesn't get into that. I'm not gonna get into that. Um, but uh, this. Actually, my book, but it's not the only copy of this book I've had. So some of it is highlighted and written in, and others of it isn't. But there's a couple things that I thought would be neat to share with you from the book. This, this is good. This is called the dependency paradox. The more effectively dependent people are on one another, the more independent and daring they become. So it goes on to talk about how. Most people are only as needy as their unmet needs. When their emotional needs are met, the earlier the better, they usually turn their attention outward. So, that just, it changes the way that you think about independence, dependency, codependent. Um, and it's, it's not arguing for a world with codependency, but rather interdependency. Um, and it's, it's funny, like, knowing this stuff and people try to rationalize their like maladaptive tendencies towards different attachment styles and it's just like hilarious to watch once you know like oh no actually the answer is to be really responsive to the people that you love and care about and um to do it with boundaries you know never do it in a way that like completely trespasses upon yourself and your own needs but for their needs to be near the top of your value hierarchy because you care about them, so they should be. Um, so, according to this book, there's like secure, avoidant, uh, anxious, and I think the book does get into anxious avoidant too, attachment styles. Um, so secure people, it says, are very reliable, consistent, trustworthy. They're attuned with their partner's emotional and physical cues and respond to them. Their emotional system doesn't get too riled up in the face of a threat, as with anxious people, but doesn't shut down either, as with avoided. Um, so, yeah, it's, to, it's a good book for thinking about all of this stuff. Um, it goes into, like, time and time again, research shows the best predictor of happiness in a relationship is a secure attachment style. Uh, they're more satisfied, happier, um, higher levels of satisfaction, commitment, trust. Uh, yeah, just security. It's all good for the secure folks. Um, so, it's interesting. I think like, no one person is, like, 100% secure or completely avoidant all the time, um, but we have these tendencies, right? And so, like, where do you spend most of your time? And it'll change over the course of your life and in different relationships, um, I think. 
so like I've known people who are like amazing uh, friends or co-workers and then they are just like terrible to date um, so it's just interesting to see those patterns in yourself and in others and recognize them so you can be like oh you want to play like the avoidant game it's triggering my anxious parts I'm gonna bow out of this because it's just not what I'm looking for I'm looking for someone who's attached um, there's a little list here uh, just edit it out where I hit the microphone yeah there's a little list of um, things that people who are secure do so the stance influences every aspect of their romantic relationships they are great conflict busters mentally flexible effective communicators not game players they want closeness and believe others want the same um comfortable with closeness unconcerned about boundaries that's kind of interesting let's dig into that one more it says they seek intimacy and aren't afraid of being enmeshed because they aren't overwhelmed by a fear of being slighted as are the anxious or the need to deactivate as are the avoidance they find it easier to enjoy closeness whether physical or emotional they are quick to forgive um they assume their partner's intentions are good uh, they are inclined to view sex and emotional intimacy as one they treat their partners like royalty and this is when they treat you or when you become part of their inner circle they treat you with love and respect uh, they're secure in their power to improve their relationship and they are responsible for their partner's well-being they expect others to be responsive and loving towards them and are responsive to others' needs. I'm kind of highlighting the things that were areas that I had to grow and overcome. Um, so I was like really independent in my youth and avoidant, oh, um, especially in romance and especially after one particular negative situation that I'm going to get to in on my Patreon because it's super personal. Um, yeah, so I've definitely had more avoidant tendencies in romance than anxious. Only a handful of times have my anxious parts been triggered. I gotta say, my experience being avoidant is so much easier <laughs> than being anxious. Being anxious is horrible. Um, being avoidant can feel really empowering and it's very limiting. Um, so that is the dark side of avoidance. I know pers from personal experience. Um, so secure is the way to go. Be open, be loving, be okay with getting burned because you you know you trust yourself and that you can pick up the pieces there afterwards. Um, it's all gonna be good. It's all good. Uh, yeah, then it talks about the anxious avoidant trap. So like when the avoidant person gets avoidant, it makes the anxious person anxious, they act cuckoo, it makes the avoidant person be like, I'm glad I'm being avoidant, I knew, I just dodged a bullet, and it's like, you created the bullet, um, dumb, <laughs> anyway, yeah, a lot of really good information in this book, um, yeah, it talks about the Phantom X, oh, and and like this ideal one and all these things that we can tell ourselves to avoid what's right in front of us even though it's wonderful um which reminds me of a story that i will tell um uh, and then we will be done with my book recommendations but when a professor of mine was getting his phd in psychology he was taking uh he was doing therapy every day for like an hour a day and as part of like his PhD program and he was really working through his issues with his mother his mother was this very career minded woman who wasn't like what he called nanny nanny very like warm and affectionate with her children so uh, he was pursuing this woman who lived in Hawaii and she was running to be the mayor of Hawaii I think he lived in California at the time and he was also having like a not very serious romantic thing with a woman in California and one day the woman in California grabbed him by the lapels and 
said, don't you see? I can give you what you need. And because he was taking so much therapy at the time, he was just like, this woman is 100% right. Like, everything I'm trying to get from this person in California who's avoidant, who's making him feel anxious and act crazy, uh, which makes her more avoidant, he's already getting from this, like, secure attached woman in California. So, they, when I knew him, like, 15 years ago, they had been together for, like, three decades, and it was the most beautiful, romantic partnership I've ever seen in my entire life. Like, she would come and audit his classes sometimes, and I would sit, like, in her and send her, like, a dork, um, which, like, I mean, in the best way possible, if that's you. So, like, literally, front row, center, that is me. And some days, this teacher, this professor would just have, like, a pep in his step, like, a bounce, and I'd be like, oh, where is she? And I'd look for her, his wife, and she would always be there. I could see that his wife was in the room based on how elated he was to be alive. And that's the only relationship I've ever looked at in my entire life and gone, that's what I want. And it all started with a man who was being avoidant with one person and anxious with another and then decided, I'm going to go all in with this lady when she called him on his avoidant tendencies. So that is my happy story for, um, oh, for all of our romantic futures. <sighs> um, so yeah, I love these books so much. I hope you love them too. Uh, highly, highly, highly recommend all of them. I think they're great. If you end up reading them, I would love to know what you think. and I